Hello once again, everybody, and welcome back to Soccer's Overtime, your weekly look inside the San Diego Soccer's and the Major Arena Soccer League. Alongside Tony Sanchez, Greg Elston here with you. It is Season 6, Episode 11. We're calling this one Once Bitten, and hopefully we're twice shy about losing anytime soon. Dog Bites Man, the headline, Chihuahua, is able to take a bite out of the soccer's uh, and that, of course, is a thing that happened just a couple of days ago. El Senor Sanchez, mucho gusto. It's great to see you once again, my friend. And uh, let's talk some soccer. we got some work to do tonight. Así es, Greg. Oh, my goodness. I don't know what happened. I don't know how I felt during, before, and after. It was a wild day there at Pachanga, but we'll get into it. Even pre-match felt a little bit weird with some surprises. Some very big surprises indeed it, it's time to get into it all you've been waiting for it and here we go on the show tonight one of the most shocking games i have seen in 15 years of covering the san diego Sonkers. almost shut out on their home floor we will break down the breakdowns in a 5-1 loss to the chihuahua savage but the weekend was only half bad hey turn it around we got something to like as well. A win, a 6-5 win in Tacoma. We will talk to the star of Saturday night's victory, Xavier Snare Williams. That'll be coming up at the bottom of the hour. Is Monterey going to go 24-0? Is Harrisburg going to go 0-24? We're going to reset the MASL tier list, the exclusive Soccer's Overtime MASL tiers list that is coming up. In this week's MASL News, the segment every other team tunes in to hear. Plus, we got another cup for the cupboard. We got a rescheduled home date, now official. We got a rookie making a splash. It's all coming up in Soccer's News, and that is ahead on Soccer's Overtime. Special thanks to all of our live audience joining us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash San Diego Soccer's. This is our home every Tuesday night. 5 p.m. Pacific, all the way until the soccer's uh, season ends. Hopefully, the Ron Newman Cup finals. But for everyone watching on YouTube, thank you so much for being a part of uh, our past experience of doing this show. Maybe set a reminder, come join us uh, the next Tuesday at 5 o'clock. But we love everybody who watches us on time delay as well. And, uh, you know, I got a, a note in the chat on Sunday, Tony, saying that the last couple of episodes of Soccer's Overtime haven't posted as a podcast. So I took a look and then I fired the producer um, and rehired. No, it was me. Oh, <laughs> I fired yeah. myself, rehired myself. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get that taken care of this week. We'll get that settled. So if anyone's listening to this on audio, uh, thanks to the dude. Uh, who was semi haranguing us about other soccer's matters uh, on on the chat, but uh, had a very good point about the podcast. So um, thanks to everybody. Thanks to everybody for your patronage of the show. If you are watching on Twitch, please uh, follow the channel so you'll be notified for future live broadcasts. If you are watching on YouTube, please subscribe to our San Diego Soccer's channel and click like on this video. Add some comments below to help drive engagement via the algorithm okay okay uh you know tony there's there are a couple of things that you'll hear me say a lot over various sports broadcasts or iterations of things uh one of the things that you'll hear me say quite often is uh there are levels there, there are levels to things there are levels to every sport you see, you can watch any one team play another team and see that team come out victorious and say, well, that must be the best team in the sport. But there are always levels to this. There's always a higher level. There's always a lower level. There's always something else to aspire to. I truly think the Soccers saw a higher level competition on Sunday than they've seen all season long. Absolutely. The Savage came in. And it, they picked up almost immediately where they left off last year. And really, the the, the silence was very comparable around the arena at times as it was after uh, La Roca's game-winning goal last season. And, I mean, I, I've never been a part of a broadcast that was on that side of things as far as, you know, such a 
departure from what we're used to seeing, right? I mean, I, I don't necessarily want to liken it to that, but I, we all saw the 7-1 destruction of Brazil by Germany. And you just look at those games and you think, well, that's not supposed to happen. Wait, it's just, it's keep getting worse and it just keeps mounting and mounting and mounting. And as the time rolled in and it looked like there might be a blank, a donut on the San Diego soccer side, I, I don't know. It was, it was a very interesting kind of out of body experience at times, but I don't want to do that again. That didn't feel good. I'm not going to lie. It, yeah. it, it did not feel good, but definitely there are levels and, you know, Chihuahua definitely brought it up that match on that particular day, any given day. And that is why I'm glad that there's parody and that there's this competition and maybe storylines coming out. You know, Chihuahua, San Diego, like, yes, there's been good games and now Chihuahua has the say. They have the W in the win column. First time Chihuahua has won in the regular season uh, against the San Diego Sockers. First time they've won a regulation match in San Diego of any length, uh, you know, in terms of playoff or regular season, I should say, but uh, of a regulation match. They've, of course, beaten them in the mini game uh, last year, uh, and but knockout game. And really, uh, you know, just a lot of things changed. A, a 16 match regular season winning streak ended, a 25 match regular season home winning streak ended all those things came to an end that all happened on sunday this is our recap segment let's say we start on a brighter note let's go chronologically let's talk about saturday first i like that the soccer's in the tacoma stars and uh soccer's tried to thread the needle this weekend tony they did not travel craig childs up to tacoma they rested four regulars who were either sick or battling some minor injuries in Leo, uh, Pardo, Serta, Mitchell Cardenas. Soccer's concede very early, two minutes, five seconds into the match. Rafael Cox, just a counterattack down the floor that really didn't get settled uh, for one to nothing. But here's the funny thing. Tacoma had made a tactical decision of their own, Tony. They flew out to Empire a day early. Chris Toth, Jamail Juice Cox, Michael Ramos, Alessandro Canale, four of their absolute best players, kind of assuming that they would lose to a full-strength San Diego team and wanting to play uh, against Empire, the team that they need to beat more, uh, at full strength. And I just find it very interesting in that if they had decided to go full squad on Saturday, they would have had a real advantage over San Diego. Yeah, no, it's a definitely like 20 foot, 20,000 foot view of what the season is on itself. And the strategy there is sound in itself because, yeah, th that's good thinking on them that they might lose this match and they'll have to look at where they can pick up points down the line. But that's something to consider as far as how this game uh, actually went. If it was a full strength to come with stars, I don't know. Like this, this might have been a double uh, negative of a weekend that we saw for um, San Diego soccer side. Well, this was certainly a game that was a contest all the way to the final whistle. We're in second quarter in our replay highlight. Now, if you are watching us live on Twitch or watching the video replay on YouTube to see uh, the blue card called and a penalty kick called against Xavier snare Williams for tackling a player in the box. And that's Nick Pereira against Lenny Islas making his MASL debut, a four second debut able to stand on the goal line and see Nick Pereira score. Welcome back to the bench, Lenny Islas, but welcome into the score sheet of the Major Arena Soccer League uh, facing Nick Pereira in a penalty kick. That doesn't seem like my favorite way to make a debut. Yeah, no, that's just like he drew it up, right? As a kid growing up, wanting to don the San Diego soccer shirt, four seconds through a penalty against the MVP, current reigning defending MVP. 3-2 on Juan Salazar's first MASL goal. First shift in, maybe his second shift total, and he gets a header off of the nice uh, Costa shot that was saved by Luis Beretta, the Tacoma backup keeper. Sal, just like the futsal game, just into the into the match, onto the score sheet, and a very outdoorsy type of header there, Tony. Not just uh, straight with the forehead into the keeper, but little nod to the side to bring it in. Yeah, no, that's the strategy you want, right? That's how you confuse the keeper, the bounce of the ground and the header is perfectly located not too much power to get it off target but very well done there by the youngster a lot of different protagonists here for the soccers who played well as a team 
four two toward the end of the second quarter. Juan Gonzalez with the steal and the two v one. Well executed. I mean, honestly, could have been a little better executed. I think the shot was probably the right play for Juan Gonzalez there, but Tavoy uh, doesn't make a meal out of it. He goes ahead and gets a snack, puts one into the net for four two. Uh, really was starting to look like it was going to be. Um, one of those more routine soccer's victories. But then right here, Guerrero Pino decides to deny a goal with the old chicken wing. Um, and that's fine. But here comes the second penalty kick of the quarter for the Tacoma start. I mean, yeah, you know, <laughs> Can't do that. <laughs> what do you, what do you want? The line like the warrior he is, but not, not in that way, man. So Pereira boop. Okay. Four, three, nice way to stat the, had the stats of the MVP penalty kicks are very nice in <laughs> indoor soccer and four, three score. And then you get into, uh, as, as we see late in the second quarter here, uh, a guy knocked down and an injury and drew ruggles. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, well, so what they ouchies, no big deal. Uh, soccer still in attack. Great save. Luis Barreto. Luis Barreto played very well in this match in his first game, both guys in their first games of the year, Beretta and Xavier snare Williams thought both keepers played well. Uh, you'll hear from Xavier a little bit later in the show. We had to pre-tape uh, that interview today, but he admitted to, you know, those nerves early in the game. There's one that actually he was able to guide down off of that near wall. At first, the folks on the broadcast thought that that was a misplay. Uh, it was not, but now we're into the third quarter and no scoring in the third quarter for the San Diego Sockers. Nice layoff by Pereira. They get the ball inside. Nice little one-two deflection goal. Centering pass, hockey-style one-timer goal there uh, for 4-4. Four, four. But just very interesting to look back and recognize, Tony, that last weekend the Sockers were shut out in both first quarters and shut out in both third quarters of their matches. And that is something you would never expect to see. Yeah, and altogether, you know, they always play a defensive style where they're not necessarily scoring in bunches in those first uh, quarters, but they will get one or two back, pouncing on the errors that the uh, opposition team does. That's not what we've been seeing. And, you know, even if you do play great defense, that doesn't mean that you don't be as productive offensively because then you have an issue. Matt Brame, speaking of issues, Matt Brame and Drew Ruggles have issues. These guys have beef. This is the second time in the last two matches that we've seen these guys face to face and head to head. And I mean, that's a bad foul. That's a really bad foul right there by Matt Brame. And that's Drew Ruggles sticking up for his teammates. So you're not going to hear me complain about that uh, one bit, not at all. But soccer's don't score on the power play. San Diego's power play uh, ineffective all weekend long. Of course, there were no penalties on Sunday. Fourth quarter, it became Xavier Snare Williams' time to shine. Fats in the fire, 4 4 match. And X starts kind of heating up. Beretta kept pace as well to keep this game at 4-4. And then eventually you're going to get to Nick Pereira and just fake, 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 roll, roll, roll. Nick Pereira, he generates goals. Yeah, he's an outstanding right. offensive player. Classic player where you know exactly what he's going to do 100% of the time. You know it's going to go ahead and go to his right preferred foot. And boom, always gets you at the end. Great player. And that was against Christian Gutierrez. That wasn't against a slouch type defender. Here's the play of the game. Xavier Snare Williams out of his net, getting the ball to Gabriel Costa, Gabi Costa, Costa letting the ball do the work, getting that goal, tying things up five to five. Finally, the soccer score in the second half, their first goal of the second half. And I think it really, you can see how excited Xavier was coming down, recognizing not only did they tie it, but he got the assist. <laughs> On this, uh, if it was a taller player, it would have gone off the back of his head. <laughs> Good job by Gabi Goal. Just let it sail over his frame uh, for five to five. Still chances. Xavier Snare Williams would be tested as the match continues. That was a great, oh, excellent defensive play by Tavoy Morgan, though. Yeah, no, excellent. Tracking down all the way to the defensive side of things. Originally called a foul, challenged immediately, and, you know, very, very, very good defending there. Like, that's picture perfect. Get all ball first, neutralize any type of counterattack there. Fantastic. Stunningly, this was called a blue card. Yes. On Tavoy Morgan. And the Sockers in a 5-5 game had to blow their challenge 
on just a a really badly missed call uh yeah. to be honest with you and you know tough tough there and of course we have tons of respect for ryan sigage but the last time we saw those guys there was some controversy as well there's xavier with his save of the game nick Pereira, point blank you start with the bar down here that's great news for san diego but then Pereira is just tracking that thing down and puts it into the basket of of xavier but he got big now we get to the game winner it's Pee Wee getting the ball loose. It's the 2v1. And how about a right footer, Brandon Escoto? Who says he can only score with the left? Juras puts it in on the far post. 233 to play for 6-5 San Diego. Huge response by a team. This is what you have come to expect over the years from the Soccers. Challenged on the road. Challenged by a team that has been the better of them for a good period of time. And finding that clutch play, finding the clutch gene uh, somewhere within them. There's another big save by Xavier down the stretch. And despite the best efforts of a sixth attacker, the soccer's defense is able to swarm to deny Tacoma any decent final chance. And the soccer's pull out a six to five victory. So, you know, was it a classical win for San Diego? It was not. I don't think the soccer's played particularly well on Saturday night, Tony. But on that night, I was willing to say, you have no Craig Childs, which is your offensive captain. You have no Cesar Cerda, who is your defensive captain. You have no Leo, who is your organizer as an offense. He is the number one midfielder for this team. No Mitchell. You know, you're missing a lot of, of but especially offensively, you're missing a lot of firepower, creativity with Mitchell and Cerda. You're missing, you know, kind of your two of your top three defenders overall so with all of that on the board never mind the fact that the soccers were supposed to fly out of Lindbergh field at 12 o'clock on friday and they wound up leaving after 8 p.m i mean i don't know if you've ever been stuck at the airport for 10 hours but you don't feel good the next day <laughs> like it's not a good feeling and i think that honestly had a knock-on effect for the entire weekend but it, it was a, a nasty nasty weekend of travel for San Diego Friday flight delayed over eight hours, get into Tacoma close to midnight, you know, into their rooms around 1 a.m. on Saturday morning, play the match 7 p.m. Saturday. Uh, most people don't know this, but on the way back from Assesso Showware Center in Kent to the team hotel, uh, soccer's Paul Savage gets a call from the airline that their plane was canceled. Oh. For Sunday morning, the team had a flight for 9 a.m. out of SeaTac to get back to San Diego, and the flight was canceled. And for about three hours, Paul and his assistant and coaches were calling around, trying to find flights, trying to find even individual flights for players to start, you know, leaving one and two at a time on Sunday morning to get out and to get to San Diego. And then at midnight, they got a call back from either the airline or the travel agent. I, I can't say exactly as to who saying, oh, they found another plane for your flight. They canceled a different flight that had fewer passengers and they've been able to find a plane for your flight. So you're back on for 9 a.m. And then when the team got to the airline or, or to the, the terminal, the plane wasn't there oh, <laughs> and the plane oh. wasn't there at 9 a.m. And the plane didn't show up till about 9.15 a.m. And then they finally took off around 9.45, uh, closer to 10 on match day on Sunday. Uh, got down to San Diego, close to 12.45. Basically, straight out of baggage claim, right to the arena. Um, just a, a really, really, really rough weekend of commercial flight travel for the San Diego soccer. So all those things, players sitting. Terrible travel, freezing temperatures in Tacoma that affects your your pregame and everything else. Six five win, you know, book it. Common dub, not a big deal. Book the W and and hopefully you're you're leaving that match going. Hey, they struggled. They didn't have all their top players. A shorthanded Tacoma team took them right to the wall. That should never happen. Like that that side, even with Pereira, shouldn't be close to San Diego in a match necessarily, but you get the dub, you get on the plane tomorrow and hopefully you can get six points out of the weekend. 
Se yeah, several factors. You know, obviously, a lot of the boys stepped up, those who haven't had as much time uh, with real in-game uh, minutes this, this season, really stepped up. Uh, but another thing to kind of factor in is I was, you know, re-watching the game and then re-watching some of the highlights is some of the players that you are going to see in that highlight package and the Chihuahua Savage package, some of the plays that would normally go through some of the runs, some of the touches, some of the passing was much more crisp over in Tacoma where those simple bounces, that luck, that ball that travels behind Xavier, that maybe goes in on Sunday. And it's just one of those matches where things were went right over in Tacoma. Some were fortunate. You know, they got themselves into a pickle by their own uh, errors at times that chicken wing, you got a penalty given by Xavier at there. So that's two goals right there to make this closer than it needed to be. But I mean, all things considered, we see this in, 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 in other iterations of the sport too, in, in the MLS and the Conca champions, whatever tournament this is where a Mexican team was stuck in a, in an airport for who knows how, how long you really have to keep that body moving. You have to get rest. Again, rest is such a key component to this. And if you're not getting rest between matches, let alone traditionally, if everything goes right, then you have these monkey wrenches thrown with a cancellation. It's just, it's a recipe for disaster. And again, I don't know if it's, it's bringing context to everything in the weekend that happened, but even then also that took the Texas game. that didn't happen. That also plays a factor because the players aren't in rhythm. They're used to having this game. Absolutely. This game that was supposed to happen, This, the preparation that goes into it, if you take that week off, the body definitely feels it. You don't have that high-stakes matchup that what you're primed for. That didn't happen uh, against Texas because of, of the water main break. But again, that's all part of that, you know, one drop at a time, one drop at a time. And it ended up being a one drop too many. Which brings us to Sunday and to the legend of Janoni Martinez. Janoni uh, Martinez, the pie a la izquierda, muy famoso, uh, over 450 goals, over 450 assists uh, playing in Mexico, was part of La Raza de Monterrey uh, in MISL, uh, played for, uh, La, uh, what was it called, uh, CCM Sidekicks, uh, down in Mexico City as well that challenged the Soccers in the semifinals in 2010-11 uh, when San Diego won. They faced Janoni Martinez in that semifinal. Chris Toth's first ever playoff win uh, was, was there. He played his career from, from the 90s and 2000s all the way to 2019 uh, with RGV when he led that team to the playoffs. Uh, Janoni Martinez is, according to the Mexican indoor journalists, the best and most famous indoor player in the history of the great country of Mexico. So Janoni Martinez brings an aura with him. I'm sure loyal players, the first time Landon Donovan stood in front of them with a whiteboard and started to talk to them, there was probably this feeling of, oh my God, the greatest American player is coaching me. And I mean, wouldn't you agree, Tony? I saw a, a bought in savage side like you could almost never see in the MASL but it's the type of thing you love to see in sports every huddle every player connected together listening vibing on Janoni Martinez Martinez just in them in them you know the jockey with the whip that just won't stop like he absolutely changed the culture in that match and, and I definitely believe that you saw that legendary status come out in his first game as Chihuahua head coach. Yeah, no, it's somebody who you respect. The press release was amazing because they call him El Jefe de Jefes, the chief of chiefs. That's the guy. That's the king of, you know, of everything. That's the guy that we're going to go ahead and put our everything into. You know what? Thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and slide you down. But here we go. Janoni, aquí está. There you go. And it paid dividends, to be honest. And, and everybody wanted to play for Janoni and they wanted to do their best. They wanted to showcase what they have and show that, you know what? You didn't join any other team. You joined the current reigning defending champions. And I think having that mentality also is going to be dangerous for everybody else. 
the MASL wants to be a sport that people can bet on. And I find that bleeping hilarious. I I would almost want to swear on soccer's overtime. I find it <laughs> hilarious because the MASL is nowhere near the level of professionalism needed to be able to give betters nationwide in Las Vegas, worldwide, sharps and fans alike, a fair swing at a bet. And let me give you an example of what I'm talking about, okay? Uh, this type of stuff happens semi-regularly in this league and far more often than it should. With Mexican teams and especially coming to San Diego, it happens almost every game. It's, it's getting to the point that it happens almost every game. Now I'll let you know what I'm talking about. Um, Every team stays at the Dana and Mission Bay, right? That's the team hotel of the San Diego soccer. So when clubs come to San Diego, they stay at the Dana. And when you stay at the Dana, of course, you submit a rooming list. You have to submit the names of the players that are on the trip. And 95 out of 100 times, you get that rooming list, and that's the roster for the next day. Because, like, why would you? fly someone the next day or keep them at a different hotel for <laughs> some reason. Like, why would you do something like that? It's the major arena soccer league, but something like that happened with the Chihuahua Savage because we had the rooming list. We had the roster. We created as, as Tony knows, our, our roster board, we create a roster board Beautiful. for every single game. And we're out there. We record our, our broadcast open down on the floor for warmups. And we talk about Janoni Martinez and we talk about the Savage. And then Tony and I turn around. We've, we're done recording. We turn around, we look around, and there's Everardo Sanchez, the previous head coach of the Savage. <laughs> and he is directing all of the training on the floor. You know, he's directing all the warm up. And then we kind of look around. I look behind the net, I look on the bench, I look in the stands. Like I know what Janoni Martinez looks like. There's no Janoni. We watched the whole warm up. No Janoni to be found anywhere. And I'm asking Tony, I'm like, in your whole life, have you ever heard of a head coach taking over? And then the next game is like against the, the top competition and the coach is just not there and lets the assistant that was demoted coach the game. We, we were flabbergasted, Tony. Uh, and then we got the lineup card. And we'll have to get to the lineup momentarily, but Janoni's signature was on the lineup card. I'm like, are they, I mean, it just said Janoni though. I'm like, did they forge this? Is this real? And finally out he comes in a, in a dapper light blue checkered suit, Janoni Martinez. He, he didn't even like, he didn't even want to let anyone see him until it was match time. I just thought that was wild. Gamesmanship. Maybe. I don't know. Like we were trying to figure out, is this the, on the signature, is that a letter G looks like it, but. Other than that, like, I've never seen that. And, I mean, there was just surprises left and right. And, uh, you know, if this is their version or way of, you know, manipulating the clock when when we're down in Mexico that they can't do over here, they can try to, you know, bend the rules and test the elasticity of let's see how much we're going to get away with. That might be part of it. And and I, I don't know. Like, it's very interesting the fact that I, that even happened and and got ruled out. So then we watch the Savage. I'm kind of going, jotting back in time just a little bit, but it's okay. Imagine it like a Tarantino movie. We're skipping back and forth <laughs> in time slightly. So again, there are Tony and I having completed our, our pregame open, and we watch the Savage you know, jog out on the field. And I'm like, we see this big dude with this weird hair, like almost like a possessed razor was like, flying around in a windstorm through the locker room and just like, oh no, it got me again. Like just taking off like chunks, like like almost like uh, something you'd see in a zombie movie or something, give him the weirdest hair possible. And it was a number that wasn't even on the list, like nowhere to be found. We're going, well, who's this dude? And it wasn't until we got back up to our broadcast perch that we found it was Cleberson Rodriguez. And hey, if you're a soccer's overtime viewer, you saw our interview with Oscar Sanchez in Monterrey. And he was talking about some of the issues with Chihuahua. And he included that they invested in these Brazilian futsal 
stars, professional futsal league stars who had not either played or contributed to the club. Well, maybe they were waiting to pay him for a big match. Cleberson Rodriguez was out there and guess what? He got a goal and he got an assist in the match. And, you know, he didn't look good in warmups, but he looked pretty good uh, in the match, Tony. Yeah, no. And just looking at, you know, now we found out that this person even exists. Like, all right, let's see who he is. And that's how we found out that, okay, you know, he has some accolades in La Liga do Brasil and Football Siete. He has a, a couple of, of trophies in the top tier of futsal over in Brazil. But that's one of the surprises that, that came along. We're like, oh, okay. Once you saw him in the game flow of things, there's a definitely an understanding of what's needed in the mechanics to play the game indoor. And he has, a, he's very athletic, but just kind of thinking back to that interview, I'm like, okay, well, if that's one of them, is, is do we, are we just going to have more surprises like these? Like what's going to happen with this team moving forward? But I mean, he played well, but hopefully they pay him enough to get himself a, a, a better, uh, you know, barber or hair routine. Yeah. I mean, Hey, if that's his choice, you know, via con Dios, it's, it's fine. But, uh, also, not on the rooming list. Number 99, Enrique Kike Canez, who we've seen over and over, hadn't been playing. Boop, there he was. Arturo Valle, one of the starting defenders from the championship game, wasn't in the lineup before, wasn't on the rooming list. Boop, there he was. And then you looked in net. And I looked up and I'm like, that ain't Terry Munoz. That's Diego Reynoso. I know this guy. <laughs> by many considered the best keeper in Mexico. At least prior to 2019, it was undisputed that Diego Reynoso was the best keeper in Mexico. In 2019, he and Berna Valdivinos split time for the World Cup team. Uh, when they went undefeated, they would play half in, half out. And then that wound up being uh, their situation in Mexico as well. And then when Monterey came back, Diego went back to Monterey. That's, that's where he lives. That's where he usually plays. But Berna went to Monterey this year. It was just Yvonne Terry Munoz and a kid from Brazil in net for the Savage, but they've decided to, to pony up and they paid for Diego Reynoso. And boy, we talk about a return on investment as we get to the highlights, Tony. Diego Reynoso, he's one of the best indoor keepers in the world. And he showed up against a soccer team that didn't bring a ton to the floor on Sunday night. Now, right here, you see you know how this team goes. They're an energy team, Tony. If any one of these early goals goes in, the soccer's find their legs and they feel very excited. But there's a calm Reynoso save. We saw Escalante kick one off the line there. Just proper planning. Reynoso's always in the right position. He is an extremely well-positioned, extremely calm goalkeeper. And early attempts here by San Diego, just a little bit off. That deflected, drew just the spin a little too fast not to get the slam dunk. We get to the second quarter. Soccer's a little lucky there, but by this point, even just a minute into the second quarter, it had been about 10 straight minutes of possession for the Savage. We just knew that the first goal was coming their way. I literally said it like 30 seconds before it happened on the broadcast, Tony, saying one nothing is coming. And then there it was, Papa Hernandez scoring again. For Chihuahua, one nothing on the board again for Chihuahua. All of it felt extremely painful. A little bit of a touch for Boris there. Nonetheless, as Cleberson Rodriguez sent the pass back, it's into the net. It's one to nothing, Chihuahua. And the second quarter, Boris Pardo, gigantic save, huge save right there. Easily could have been 2 nothing. This is just a tremendous stop by Boris against Luis Medrano, but the Soccers barely had a chance on net in this quarter. Here's what could have been one try, knocked down. Watch the physicality and the intensity of this Chihuahua team defensively, and when a ball gets through, there's Reynoso, perfectly positioned to kick it out. Top of the arc, that's the things we dream of for San Diego. Child's into the wall, Ruggles off the post, still one nothing. Good saves by Boris there. This is a highlight reel. So what you don't see are all the minutes of Chihuahua just carrying the ball, carrying the ball, carrying the ball. Here's the look that you think, okay, first minute, third quarter, we're going to score. 
Here's the thing about that play. I don't know if you could do it. Oh, we're watching it right here. Watch Gutierrez. Gutierrez steps around, makes the unselfish play. You know, Christian hasn't been shooting a lot. He's straight at the net, but he might have had his shot blocked. He made the right play, but in making that play, it allowed Leal to get back into the mat, into the play, and to make the save. You see it one more time, stepping around Popper, but there's Leal. Yeah, and it's you're choosing the correct plays, right? And they're just not going in, Craig. I was it was incredible to see, honestly. It was frustrating. <laughs> More opportunities, but Reynoso again, you never felt like he was truly challenged, but that's the way Diego plays the position. He holds his ground. A lot of times when goals are scored against Reynoso, you'll see him just kind of standing there. And it, because his the position, you know, you shot the angle past his position. He just keeps calm and keeps his position. Great goal for two nothing for Chihuahua. I said on the broadcast, two felt like seven. Uh, this is uh, the young kid Castaneda who wears three seventeen. Uh, in the chat, they said the story there is that was the date his mom passed away. Um, so definitely some heart behind that number. Uh, and then there's Reynoso, just ready to go, reading plays keeping his eye on things and stuff starts to turn the other direction for the San Diego Sockers. Castaneda in the well, there it is three, nothing. Well, that's beautiful. beautiful. You can say about that. It's again, the Savage were playing at optimum pace. They were really efficient. Like it's getting your car right after an oil change. They got an oil change and a tune up as well. And they were firing on all cylinders here. Usually Boris, you know, gets a hand on these or just, it just wasn't happening, and he played well. Boris played well, but even then, there's nothing that can be done when a team is just all over you. Culberson has to be excited. Cleverson, pardon me, has to be excited. Uh, bringing Pardo to his knee there with the fake on the roll before getting the, the goal over him. Uh, that's a very clutch goal. I roll tells the story yeah. <laughs> from Boris right yeah. there, but just w watch the technique here. Pereira asked the fake. Oh, drag. Had brought him to the knees, right foot to left foot. Gleberson for nothing. Chihuahua. Great. So doing his stuff. One handed save. Beautiful. Costa. Now another one. Reynoso. <laughs> just. Soccer start the fourth quarter in six attackers, almost get one back there. You thought maybe if they got one and then another in the first couple of minutes, it, it might really just change the dynamic. That's another one that they could have had right there inside of the post and out. Another dribbler off the post. Little things, little misses. The effort there, the team is playing their second game in literally what? Let's see. Uh, 12... 17 hours second game in 17 hours and in two states for that matter chihuahua no games this week week of training with their brand new coach chance to rest in san diego chance to sneak players in however they snuck in reynoso and everyone else finally a goal <laughs> finally a goal i really thought it was going to happen i was really afraid it was going to happen don't give him that much space to will score Thank you for giving him that much space to voice scored. We are not shut out for the first time in modern soccer's history. Cherry on top for Miguel Angel Diaz in the final minute for 5-1, your final score. And I do, and I don't know. At this point, I don't know if I need to go back and look this up, but I believe this is either tied for or it is the most emphatic home loss in modern San Diego soccer's history. Uh, if you just go back and see and how great this team has been uh, in terms of a, a home team, I think this is their ninth all-time loss in 15 years at home. But to actually be shut out almost at home by the Chihuahua Savage, you kind of have to put this one at the top of the list, Tony, in terms of opposing team efforts. Yeah, you could definitely see there was a specific shot that we both looked at each other going into the fourth quarter, and it, it's just a stark contrast. You have Savage, everybody's huddled up, lasered focus in. They're winning. They are on pace for a 4-0 to zero win, but they're still getting yelled at. They're still getting instructions. They're still getting educated on what could be better and how to finish this and how to keep going. And on the other side... I didn't necessarily see that. It was a tired team. There was a, a team that had 
heavy, heavy, heavy legs, and there's nothing for them to have done at that point. And I mean, I, I saw a comment earlier. It's just talking about uh, Reynoso and how he's been lucky against the soccers. And sure, look, there's something that in the soccer community and the goalkeeper community will say is that un portero sin suerte no es portero. A, a goalkeeper without luck isn't a goalkeeper. That's just part of the job. That just comes with it. You have to be fortunate in that sense. But at the same time, it's the other way around. The soccers were not sharp. They were not able to execute in the last third to get anything really past that defense who was locking everybody down. They were incredibly quick. They were incredibly sharp with what they were doing. And honestly, they, they just got outplayed. They just got outplayed in every single sense the soccers did. And I've never seen a, a, a soccers team just be manhandled this way. And you know what? Hopefully, there's positives to be taken. And Pobrecito Empire is all I'm going to say. If things go well, Pobrecito Empire coming up on Wednesday. Yeah, uh, Callan in the chat uh, brings up a playoff loss. Uh, that was a year I was away. 10-4 uh, Sonora winning in San Diego in the playoffs is the worst loss he's seen in his 11 years on the mic. Uh, that's That's got to be it. I was kind of thinking regular season, uh, Callan, in terms of results, but I think you make a great point there. That's probably the one. Um, just a couple notes from my uh, preview material for tomorrow's match to underline this because – we soccer's fans, the team loses and we go into, well, look, normally I look like this and then the soccer's lose. <laughs> and I look like that. I look like that. Um, here's a couple of fun notes for you. With that loss, the soccer's are now 85, seven and one all time since 2009 at home. 85, seven and one <laughs> in the last four plus seasons. 47, three and one. 47, three and one at home. That was the third. That was the third mm -hmm. right there. So this team dominates on their home floor. This team finds wins all the time on their home floor. They come back. If they're down, they come back. And I think that's kind of why that game was. I, I'll just speak for myself. Like that game was breaking me on the broadcast. I, I was legitimately, I, I'm just telling you my God's honest truth, Tony. I was nervous when I turned on the replay the next day because the way I felt inside, I'm like, I hope I didn't rip the team. Like I, that's what I thought to myself. Like, I hope I didn't rip the team. And, and if someone on the team said, hears me say that the soccer's are being dominated when it's two, nothing. And they don't like that. Um, there are plenty of soccer matches outdoors that are one nothing, two nothing, zero zero, where one team dominates the other, uh, and that's what I was talking about: possession, control, game flow. All of that was dominated by Chihuahua. The scoreboard wasn't, you know, two nothing is is nothing, right? Three nothing, yeah. four nothing. All these scores are, are are meaningless. The soccer can score three goals in a minute. We we know that, but as each period went on, and the team is not only not scoring, but you know, you saw essentially in that highlight video, we just played like literally every chance that the soccer's generated in the match. It's not the number that we are used to seeing. And, and you said it too, Tony, the, the shots of the bench in the third and fourth quarters and, and the Chihuahua side being activated and together and linked and the soccer's having half the guys listening, half the guys turning the other direction, some guys staring into the sun, you know, it, it just, it wasn't a great look. It looked like a really tired team that got beaten physically, mentally, emotionally, just beaten across the board by the Chihuahua Savage. In many ways, it was a perfect storm. A tired soccer team, a bad travel weekend, an interstate back-to-back, Janoni -back. Martinez's first game, Diego Reynoso's first game, Cleberson Rodriguez's first game. Like All of these things combined soccer's lose 5-1. The the only thing like you know, we're sad, we're mad, we're frustrated, we're we're going home. I'm thinking about lineup changes, I'm thinking about tactic changes, I'm thinking about everything. You watch the game back. Watching the game back didn't make me necessarily feel better about the game. I'm not going to lie to you, it didn't look better the next day <laughs> on tape. It's not a pretty tape. It's a tape I hope Phil Savaggio and Cheeky Luna coach off for a month straight. 
Um, the one thing that really disappointed me was that you saw the players that the soccer's held home on Saturday night and Boris was sick. So, you know, I thought he played fine. You know, uh, Serta Mitchell, those guys have been dealing with some nagging things. I thought, you know, were, were they like giant factors in the game? No, but also you didn't see them on the wrong end of many of these highlights uh, in, in the, in the game flow. And obviously he's been a friend for, for years and years, but the soccer's captain is Craig Giles and, and Craig hasn't traveled yet. I think tomorrow he'll travel to Ontario. He didn't travel to Tacoma for any of these road matches. He didn't travel to Dallas. He was fresh. He was the guy the soccer's needed to count on, on, on Sunday evening for offense. You know, Christian Gutierrez was tired. Tavoy Morgan was tired. Those guys played full matches the night before and Craig put up a zero and a zero. You know, and he really wasn't, he was barely even on the field uh, in the second half because of the game flow and because of the nature of it. And of course, at his age, he's looking for set pieces, power plays, corner kicks, you know, ways to impact the match. We all understand it. It's not Craig Giles of 2011. You know, it's, 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 it's later in his career, but healthy, rested, captain, leader, 0-0 zero, zero on the board. It's just, it's tough. It's, it's one I'm sure he, he doesn't need me to say it. You know, I mean, this is a guy who knows it. It's like talking to Manny Machado about his batting <laughs> average. You know, it's like, he doesn't need me to say it. He he understands everything that happened. But that was kind of the one thing in the end, after I kind of sorted through all of it and all of it again, I'm like, gosh, we didn't send five guys to Tacoma. And we still looked like we sent everyone to Tacoma because the guys who did rest didn't really impact the game on Sunday the way you hoped they would. Yeah there weren't any combination of players. I think that would have made a difference on Sunday against Chihuahua. And I mean, talking about Craig, right? Like this is just, you know, something that I was thinking as well is that that pressure I think has kind of seeped in a little bit, perhaps that big 400. Yeah. I mean, to have zero zero is again, almost impossible. I, I, I would have bet my anything to tell you that, yeah, no, he'll get an assist. He'll get he'll get a goal. He'll get something here at home. We've had back-to-back -back chances to have that here at home. And you know what? Might happen at, at, uh, at Ontario. Might happen up north. But at the end of the day, that needs to be the next step, at least for Craig Charles' sake, is just get that out of the way. Just there's passes. There's times. There's frustration that you can see from Craig early on in a game which you normally wouldn't see you still have that intensity from craig he gets a bad foul gets a bad call he's going to be in the re uh, referee's face but there's times where there's a chance that just doesn't go his way something gets a bad rebound or uh, a bad miss from him and there's just there's clearly a pressure there and i think let's just get that taken care of let's just move on forward but other than that i, I think i have to agree with you where it's like then what was the point of, of resting players not that I understand what, what what the point was, but if might as well have played the same roster you played up there, give the kids a chance, give the chit, give get the kids some legs. I don't know. Yeah. It, it was it was it was hard to watch. <laughs> it was difficult. It was it was frustrating, man. It was frustrating for all soccer fans. You can see it in in the chat as well. So many of our fans saying it's not just a loss; it's the way it happened. You know, a ton of physicality. I, honestly, every single one of Chihuahua's tactics were great. They were great, very physical in the first two quarters. You know, Shane Butler and crew, I, they weren't committing blue collars, though. They really weren't. They were just committing fouls, you know, and you can rack up in this version, in this MASL version of four personal fouls for a blue card instead of 16 fouls. You could rack up over 30 fouls and a half without actually getting carded for anything. They didn't rack up 30, but they fouled the soccer's. They slowed the match down. When they had the ball, they possessed the ball. They spent the whole first half possessing the ball. And it was just like a heavyweight fight, working the body, working the body, working the body, you know, body punches for the first six, seven, eight rounds. Doesn't seem like it's doing anything at all, but slowly you were building that up for it to all fall down. And, and I think Chihuahua just had all the credit in the world, a great game plan, Ultra, ultimately motivated, 
Uh, not a fun game to watch. I agree. It wasn't a fun game to watch. It, by design and style, it was not a fun game to watch. It was a game that Chihuahua wanted to choke the life out of this match, and they did it. And again, in the second half, there was no response from San Diego. That's the thing that's disappointing. That's the thing that you just count on as a soccer fan, is even when you're down three, even when you're down four, the other team is going to be sweating before this game's over. Even if we lose, it's going to be 4-3, and the extra attacker's going to be in, and you guys are going to be on your heels, and you're going to be praying to be able to survive this match. And that is not the way it happened on Sunday. So pick it up and recognize just what I said to start this very long replay segment. We'll say to finish it. There are levels. There are levels to competition, and the soccers need to know the top level is Monterey and Chihuahua. It's not just yeah. Monterey. It's Monterey and Chihuahua. This is the level. This is where the championship is. It's up here. And the championship of this league right now, it's going to be Chihuahua and Monterey. The soccers have to change that conversation. They can do it. I have all the faith in the universe that they have the most talent on their roster, that they have the leadership, that they have the character, that they have everything that they need to win the championship. I firmly believe that this team has what it takes to win the championship, maybe win the shield, although we'll get to MASL news in a little bit. But there are levels, and now you know where the level is and what you have to do. You should know now what you have to do to get there. Okay. Earlier this afternoon, because he had to work during uh, this time, he's working tonight, had the opportunity right when I got home from Annie and Elston, uh, 10 to 2, Monday through Friday, 97.3 The Fan, San Diego's number one sports station. I uh, got the chance to sit down and chat with Xavier Snare Williams, the winning goalkeeper from Saturday. Please enjoy this recorded conversation with the X-Man. All right, here he is, Xavier Snare Williams, joining us on Soccer's Overtime. Obviously, it's a different period of time. I got a different outfit on. Everyone now knows we're back in time. Xavier, thanks so much for finding this time to join us. Of course, of course. Anytime you ask, I got you, Craig. Much appreciated, my friend. Now, uh, we just talked about two games. I want to focus on the one we liked a lot more, that 6-5 victory over Tacoma. And it was your first chance to get between the pipes this year uh, as a starting keeper. Uh, how excited were you in anticipation of this match? You know what? I'm not going to lie to you. It was like a little bit of excitement and then a whole lot of nerves. I was so nervous. I was so my mom. I was like, man, I'm like on edge. I don't want to like look horrible. You know, I want to be there for my team. And it was like, so it was a lot of, it was a lot of excitement. Um, but it was also, like I said, like a lot of nerves um, leading up to the match. But, you know, the biggest thing for me was just remembering, okay, you could be as nervous as, you know, the tallest mountain in the world, but as long as you get your butterflies in line, everything will be okay. And of course, game action can do that for you, right? You get out there and, and maybe even the first and second quarter, it's a different feel, but but things really came together for you in the fourth quarter there, making some big stops. And I imagine that's where the point where all that other stuff's out the window and it's just reaction time, right? Yeah, exactly. No, like once the, every quarter was like a build, like a stepping stone. So like the first quarter, I was like super nervous, but you know, it's like, okay, we got this, you know, just focus on feet and passing this and that, like simple stuff. And then second quarter was like, okay, like getting into the game, we still have the lead. Third quarter was like, all right, you know, we're in it, but now it's like go time. And then the fourth quarter was like, once we got five five, I'm like, mm -mm, we gonna win this game. Like it's it's over. Like I'm I will throw like I said, I throw my chest in front of everything. So I was like, no way. I'm like, we got to get this win. And then when we got it, it felt so good. One thing I know that they have been working with you since your rookie year is footwork passing putting the ball in the corner, getting that dump pass into the glass that's a usable pass for your midfielder or your forward. You had to be gratified to see the way the ball kissed off the glass for, for Gabriel Costa uh, for that equalizer. Oh, my goodness. Craig, when I tell you I felt like a five-year-old when he scored it, I was just so excited. It was funny because, like, it's just our job, like, as a keeper, like, right, get the ball down, help our teammates out, you know, all of that. But it just felt like such a reward when I hit it 
that was like, I thought it was too low. Like I was just, when I struck the ball, I was like, ah, oh, it was a little too low. And I was trying to like get it down there. And then when it went through and he got it, I was like, oh, okay, like cool. And then when he hit it, I was like, no way, is that gonna go in? And then when it went in, I just felt like, oh my gosh, like I said, like a big fiver on a running goal. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, my buddy just scored. <laughs> so it was a really cool feeling that everything came together and, you know, really grateful for, you know, Sean always coming early to help me like work on my feet, especially this year. So, you know, very grateful for that. You know, you have two incredible mentors every day at training in in Boris Pardo and in Victor Melendez, your guys' goalkeeper coach. And obviously, Boris is one of the great indoor keepers of the modern era. He's a three-time goalkeeper of the year. He's the MASL wins leader. You know, like he's got this list of stuff that it makes sense why he starts 23, you know, 22 matches in a season. But you're learning from the elite at, at a young age. What, what do you feel you're, what are you pulling out of this? I'd say the biggest piece of advice I have to say Boris gave me that's helped me grow from like that first year to now is it's truly a mental piece of the game of I can hit a ball, you know, say eight out of 10 times perfectly. But if, if I'm in my head, I'll miss 10 out of 10 times. So I might have the tool to do it, but if my mental side isn't there to hit it or like I'm like drowning myself in anxiety or whatever, and I'm messing up because I'm trying to be perfect instead of just hit the ball, then that's what I'm gonna mess up on. But if I can get out of my head and then just go with the flow of like everything, that I could, you know, do so much better. So I have to thank him for that piece of advice because it's helped me like, okay, like calm and then just hit. Calm, just hit. So I'm very thankful for Boris to be that mentor act in that aspect. You sound like me at the golf course. Like oh. get out <laughs> get out of your head, be calm and just hit the ball. I mean, and every time that that happens, it's so much better. I I, I can't help but agree with this advice. It's hilarious. Yeah, no, I remember that was one time I kept hitting the ball right. And he's like, you're thinking about hitting the ball right, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, see, you keep thinking about hitting the ball right. You're going to hit it even more right. I was like, oh, yeah, huh? <laughs> he started laughing. So I was like, I just thought about hitting. I'm like, hey, I'm just going to hit, just strike it, just strike it. And then I struck the next ball. It was perfectly fine. So, no, he's, That's he's awesome. Yeah, outstanding stuff. Uh, Victor, meanwhile, comes up with some of the more unique training regiments uh, that I think you could see trying to catch the squishy ball that's hit off of a tennis racket. Uh, what it, is it some, like sometimes when you see some of these new things, how much how difficult is it to assimilate that in? <laughs> I remember I was like, now I'm used to it. Now I'm like, all right, let's do it. I'm like all about it because the first time I want to say it was last year. My uh, first year in the uh, on the team, he said doing something where like you throw the ball, like you said, the squishy balls. But there's also another one where you throw the ball up, you pass the ball back, and you catch it. And I'm like, huh? They're like juggling. So I'm like, I was just so new to everything, and I was like a baby duck. I could not do anything. It was hilarious. And so now that I've like gotten used to it, I love it because every little aspect helps. Where it's like you throw the ball up, so you have to think about out of your peripheral like timing and you're focusing on hand. So like every little thing he does, there's a reason for it and definitely helps like my aspects of the game. So I'm very grateful for that too. Um, I gotta just say, it's so delightful to be talking about all this pleasant stuff. It's such a nice respite from talking about Chihuahua and, uh, and what we've had to talk about in the first half hour of this show, but take us a little bit inside the locker room because look, obviously the soccer's and losing, it's not something you ever want to get used to. Uh, and and believe me, there are locker rooms in every sport. They get quite used to putting up a one to five, you know, to putting up a, hey, it's second game of a back to back. We we get crushed in this game. No big deal. I know this soccer team holds itself to a standard unlike almost any other. So after a game like that, respecting to the utmost the competition of Chihuahua, how good they are, how Janoni got them coached up. What What was the feeling like in the room? It was definitely a feeling of like, I don't want to say despair, but it was like one of those like heartbreaks kind of like, you know, we worked so hard and then we lost. It was like, wow. And there's like a lot of things we got to fix, but I'd say everything in a nutshell is our biggest thing moving forward is like, we have to stay together and work together and then just fix the little knots and, you know, bumps and just smooth everything out. But honestly, like one of the things is like, we rather ha have the loss now than the playoffs so it's like we got a taste of this bitter medicine so now it's only going to help us grow stronger and you know we could start soaring
So that would be the biggest thing. Yeah, I mean, it really feels like there's a standard really being set by Monterey and by Chihuahua. And, and you know, Chihuahua's only losses are to Monterey. So you know, you, when you look at those two teams together, I mean, it's just clear that they've, they're planning on how to beat you. And I think holding the, that level in mind, like keeping that centered, is going to be critical to the soccer's winning a championship this year. No, completely agree. Yeah, we have to, you know, they're trying to beat us. Everybody wants to bring their best game when they play us. So now it's just how can we level up and re not restructure, but like fix things to be more um, like a mystery, you know, because everybody studies us. Everybody knows, you know, what we want to do. So now it's like, OK, how could we surprise somebody and, you know, come out and, you know, give them that soccer's magic? All right. Last thing, I'll let you go. You went with the green kit. Uh in Tacoma, and it just made me think about you know a sweet pea being a green pea, and be, being out there in the pod, and uh, you know just excellent choice uh, in terms of going with the green there. I think <laughs> for anybody who doesn't know, sweet pea is the nickname my mom gave me because I know people be like sweet pea, yeah. <laughs> so that's Craig's love. It's like an Easter egg, you know. <laughs> anybody who games, it's like sweet pea is my nickname. And it's finally out. Okay, year three. You get it, Craig. I give it to you. Yeah. I, just, <laughs> I love it. But you know, the irony is, I didn't even think that we were about like we wore green. You're completely right. <laughs> it was perfect for the sweet pea. <laughs> I did not correlate that one. Well done. I I tip my hat to you, Craig. Listen, that was good. The dad jokes are in reserve. <laughs> you can hold it for the right moment. Boop, drop it right in. Just like a was... just like a pea in the soup, you know, just drop it in right there. Uh and and, and it all works out. Xavier, I know you got to get to work. Really appreciate your time. Great game on Saturday. Look forward to seeing you out there again soon. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you, Craig. Thank you for always having me on. You bet. I love that kid. What a ray of sunshine. That's that's amazing. He's so excited to be in the position and, and and grateful and i've ran into him and i saw him in action with soccer's two last year and it, it's such a great person and human being to have in the locker room and everybody needs an xavier in their life at some point so it's good to have him and and man like the way he was describing those training sessions it, it brought me back i was uh, he was describing i'm like oh yeah like yeah you do this like kind of into my own ptsd of soccer training back in the day and it's a very Mr. Miyagi way of, of doing things that Boris does of like, what am I doing this for? And then boom, boom, boom. You put it in action in the game and you're like, ah, okay. That's, that's why we do that. 100%. Big thanks to Xavier Snare Williams, who again is in a work shift right now. So he couldn't join us live, uh, but we got the chance to crank that out. So thanks to him for making the time earlier this afternoon. Thanks to myself for making the time as well. Big, big ups to, to both of us. Uh, and to all of you for watching for watching the interview thank you so much we couldn't do it uh we couldn't do it without you i just i couldn't help but notice the the viewer count start to tick up 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 you know why because it's time for masl news ah it's time for the segment that all the gms all the coaches players man we talked about we talked about Defender of the Year a couple weeks ago, Tony. I was at the futsal exhibition up in Anaheim. Who sidles up next to me? My man, Uzi Tayu. Uzi was oh. there. He was like, let me ask you a question, Craig. What is it? What do you need to vote for the Defender of the Year? And like, we started talking about it. We started chopping it up about stats and everything, uh, everything else. Phil comes up to me. Hey, if we somehow get postponed in, in SeaTac and we can't get back, I don't want you ripping the league. For the travel schedule on soccer's overtime, I'm warning you, MASL News. It's why we're the show of record in the league. So, listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and help out a couple of teams uh, in weird ways to start off MASL News. Monterey is playing momentarily against Kansas City. Uh, Bamos comments. Bamos comments. Uh, <laughs> we'd love to see a big comments dub. However, comments were in Monterey Sunday, and they got smacked mapped 12 5 and it wasn't close it was 8 1 at the half it's what we dream of that's what monterey is doing the teams just sucking the life out of them crushing their soul and then going into the halftime locker room uh 12 5 was the final in that game monterey is now 
nine and O. Oh, and it's a literal question, Tony. Can anybody beat the Flash this year? Honestly, they are doing something incredibly impressive. And it's not to say that nobody saw this coming. I think that once you saw the roster that they were going into this season with front office and 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 uh, training staff, everybody considering the fact that Berna isn't necessarily the first goalkeeper, they're rotating. That's how good this team is. They have a solid squad, solid depth, and they're able to get it done home and away. And they're just rolling over and steamrolling this competition. And it makes me a little happy that you know they weren't necessarily in the West this time around. It's good and it's bad, right? It's good in yeah. that you don't have to play Monterey. It's bad in that you don't get to play Monterey. Mm -hmm. Soccer's beat Monterey three times last year, and therefore Monterey couldn't finish at our level because we beat them. So, uh, you know, there's the good and the bad with that. If Monterey wins tonight against Kansas City, I'm looking at their schedule and I'm trying to find games that Monterey could possibly lose. The next one would be their next game on Sunday because the Janoni Savage, instead of the Chihuahua Savage, will be in Monterey for the fifth of their six meetings. So will Chihuahua come off of the match against us, bring that same intensity, Diego against his former team? Can they, can they get the dub on Sunday? That's an opportunity. On Sunday, January 28th, Monterey goes back to Milwaukee. Their second trip to Milwaukee, first time they went there, the Wave had the lead most of the match, and the Flash came back, and they won in overtime. Or was that in Kansas City? I, I might have the two games mixed up. Uh, nonetheless, Milwaukee, that's a chance, right? Milwaukee at home is good. That's a chance for Monterey to drop a game. I don't think they're going to lose at Tacoma or at Empire, but you never know about a team that comes to the West Coast and flies people out, you know, it's not impossible, but I'd say it's unlikely. Uh, I would then travel all the way down to sun Sunday, February 25th, flash at Utica City. I've said it before. I think there's levels to this, and I think Monterey's probably at a higher level, but that's at least a chance to lose a game. Flash on a long road trip end of February into March at Harrisburg, at Utica, at Texas, at Dallas, March 7th at Chihuahua. That could be the Savages' last chance to beat Monterey. Losing to the Flash four times got Everardo Sanchez demoted. Janoni's there to beat Monterey. So you got to hope at least one of those two Chihuahua games, the Savage beats Monterey. I think you have to look at Milwaukee at home as having a chance to beat Monterey. Buddy, I think that's it. I mean, maybe, maybe on that long road trip, Maybe there's a game where someone gets hurt or someone's tired or or whatever, but I'm looking at two or three matches as the only opportunities for the Flash to lose. So the odds are they're going to win somewhere between 22 and 24 games this year. Yeah, barring any potential injury that can derail their season, I think they even then they still have the players and the depth to, to move on through. But as you get closer to the playoffs, these teams that are this good tend to only get better as time rolls on. And that's the competition that's going to be facing Janoni and the Savage. And I think, you know, I think if it gets to it, you want those games to kind of align and, and situations, especially looking at the chances of the soccer's winning the supporter shield. And again, if for whatever reason this season, the soccer's just want to punt that away. Sure. It'd be great again. But the real mission is to get the Ron Newman Cup, then sure. But that's still part of this narrative, and that's going to set you up for success. And do you really want to have a chance, an opportunity to get eliminated before the Western Conference Finals? Do you want to give a chance for another team to be that A side and be as primed as they can be? I'm not sure if the soccer want to be in that situation, but. All hats off to Monterey because, again, they look like the juggernaut, not just in the East, not just in Mexico, but just in the league right, right now. On the flip, the poor Harrisburg Heat went out last weekend and dropped a couple more. And, uh, you know, shout out Joey Tavernisi. Love you, pal. Pat Healy, former Blast uh, 
Yikes. Baltimore beat them five to three. Everyone, everyone's beaten the Heat so far this year. I did think it was funny when we did that that season opener against Tacoma, <laughs> Tony. Yeah. And I talked about Matt Brame, and I just said offhand, like, must be nice for Matt Brame to go to a team where he's got a chance to make the playoffs. And I heard from Joey Tavernisi directly. I heard through my owner, from the owner of the Heat. They weren't happy. They were not happy that I would casually mention that the Heat would probably not make the playoffs. Guys, being self-aware is one of the keys to wisdom. <laughs> like, and maturity. You're 0 and 9. You're not making the playoffs. You're not going to win 15 in a row from here. But I'd love you to win a game. So can we find a win for the Heat on the scoreboard? Can we stay away from a, from a bagel for the year? Can we get some of that Papa John's pizza order in Harrisburg that we crave so much for scoring four goals and maybe getting a win? Let's find a win for the Heat. Harrisburg is hosting Utica and Baltimore this weekend. Those are the teams that have just creamed them all year long. Like may, maybe you'll beat Baltimore on the beat Baltimore at home. February 2nd, Harrisburg at St. Louis. Let's go. St. Louis go. not playing well. Scoring about a goal a game. Mm -hmm. That's so that. <laughs> this is an opportunity for you, Harrisburg. I'd like to see you take advantage of it. Uh, at Milwaukee, no. Versus Monterey, no. Maybe you'll beat Baltimore. At Tacoma twice. Maybe you get them the second time. Maybe, 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 maybe Tacoma sleeps on one of those matches versus Dallas. I mean, come on. If there's a team <laughs> you could beat, Dallas at home, back to back, you got to get one of those. Yeah. Got to get one of those. If you get past March 10th without a win, buddy, it's over. <laughs> yeah. It's over. Blast Utica, blast Chihuahua, Chihuahua. It'll be Dunsey, Duns, Dunzo at that point. So we're rooting for the heat. Would love to see him beat Baltimore at home. I feel like it's something they do at least once a year is beat Baltimore at home. Yeah. You don't want to get blanked at all. That's, you know, that's not ideal, but come on. El gol de la honra, the, the win of honor. Yes. <laughs> Gana de hombre. Gana de hombre. Is that what it would be? Gana de hombre. De honra. Ondra, Ondra. It's a difficult Gana de word. Ondra. <laughs> on, on, what did I say? Ombre? Ghana. Win of man. <laughs> Ghana de ombre. Man of Ghana. Ghana man. <laughs> it's late. It's late and it's getting later. Um, Not too late to get the tiers list out, though. Let's do it. All right. Crank, so let, let's crank it up. I have it already preset. Did you want me to share that one? I can share one that we can go and fill in as we go, but I already let's fill it in. It. Let's fill it in. All right, let's fill it in. Let's go here. Boom, boom. Well, maybe if I let me just reset this because okay, you know. Oh, hey, as you reset it, uh, yeah. D Bishop in the chat says, Craig, talk about the doctor's comments about Devoy. You passed last week. I didn't pass. I I, I brought that up on last week's show. Uh, I said that consider the source, mm -hmm. not disparaging Jonathan Reimer, but he was repeating what Gerardo Hurado was saying about Tavoy Morgan. Gerardo Hurado, who is now a member of Empire Strikers and who got in fights with Tavoy Morgan at training two different seasons, those two guys did not get along at all. Hurado did not like Tavoy. Tavoy did not like Hurado. So for Gerardo to come up to Empire and then start talking and saying that soccer's players don't like Tavoy, Gerardo doesn't like Tavoy. <laughs> it's very simple. Very <laughs> simple. It's, it's called projection. You have a thing you feel and you put it on someone else. You say everyone feels this way. No, you feel that way. Uh, soccer's players do not hate Tavoy Morgan. <laughs> soccer's <laughs> players are very grateful for Tavoy Morgan to be on their team. All teams in every league, in every situation, from semi-pro to the NFL Super Bowl teams, have players who dislike each other, have players who the team loves but on certain days gets mad at or doesn't like a thing or a behavior but then moves along. And that's universal. 
Okay, that's universal to all players and teams. Urado does not like Tavoy. Tavoy does not like Urado. If Tavoy Morgan was saying things about Gerardo Hurado, I would say, consider the source. <laughs> <laughs> and when Hurado says things about Tavoy, I say, consider the source. Okay. Uh, but Callum McClurg notes, uh, the worst loss in the regular season for the San Diego Soccers is 12 to 9, January 11th, 2014 against Las Vegas. That's the only three goal loss previously in soccer's regular season home history. You don't have to go back to pre Callan because the soccer's literally never lost at Del Mar arena. So. Wow. There you go. Okay. Okay. It is tier list time. I like before, you know, many tier lists on the tier maker. It's S A B C D. Instead, we have contender fringe, the rest C D. That's fine. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. A. Yeah, I like S. Okay. Go S. Let's go A. Go B. Okay. Are you ready? Here we go. The S tier. It's the Monterey Flash. That's it. One team That's in the it. tier. All right. That's it. S tier. S tier is Monterey. Monterey is the best team in the league right now. That should not be a, a word of insult to a soccer's player or a soccer's coach or a soccer's fan. They're nine and zero. Oh. They have dominated the competition. Dominated. They have blown teams out of the water. They have won in the United States multiple times. S tier is Monterey, and it's Monterey alone. Let's go to the A tier. Let's put our club up there. Boom. I'm not discounting the Soccers. They lost one game. <laughs> yeah, they lost one game. Give me a break. It's not the Aztecs where we drop them out of the rankings because they just lose one game. And you were right. I, I, I saw some uh, rankings floated around, and I think you, you mentioned it in between a commercial break. Like, watch, we're going to go ahead and be placed here, and this is the reason, and that's exactly it. You're a truth teller, Craig. It just manifests itself, and I think – it was ridiculous. Yeah. You, yeah, yeah, you saw that, right? It's yeah. on the MSL website. It's like Monterey's one and, and Utica's two, and I think Texas is three. Mm -hmm. And then us? Yep. What the hell are you doing, Frankings? <laughs> These are the real rankings right now. Next in the A tier, Chihuahua. Chihuahua made it. Wow. That, yeah. Tier is over. Tier is over. That's it. That's it. Tier is done. There is a level to this thing, and the level is Monterey and Chihuahua. And the Soccers are there, too. Okay, I'm not going to put Chihuahua ahead of San Diego just for one win. But you almost could. You almost could. Fact is, they're 3-4. and four. Fact is, also, they're 3-0 and oh against every team not named Monterey. Okay? Soccers can't say that. Let's go to the B tier. Utica City FC. Kansas right. City Comets. Milwaukee Wave. Texas Outlaws. Ooh. Here are the teams that could win a series. These are all teams that could win a series in the playoffs. Utica looks good, but they are not at Monterey's level. Kansas City, a little bit of a dip. I would have put Kansas City over Utica before this weekend. Utica went to Kansas City and won. Got to give them their flowers, man. Got to give them their flowers. Milwaukee Wave, they've gotten a lot better over the course of the last two, three weeks. Those are your top three contenders in the East that are not named Monterey. That's your, that's your playoff field for the East right there. And listen, Texas, they're calling it the mom line, right, with Morales, <laughs> Ortiz, and Mendez. Those guys give you a chance. There's no question about it. There's no question about it. Some folks in the chat might say this is a little bit too low. Let's go to the C tier. Let's start okay. it with Tacoma. Yeah, Tacoma's only lost to San Diego. You could put them higher. But also, who have they really beaten? Yeah, like that doesn't seem quite right, especially with the teams in that tier. So, yeah, 100%. Not dissing Tacoma. I, I'm really not. I mean, the soccer's are 4-0 against them, obviously. They're they're undefeated against everyone. Okay, yeah, they 
Yes, K. Vibbard, they beat Utica City FC. Can we can we break that down a little bit? Utica City FC played the night before in Milwaukee with their second string goalkeeper and then went to Tacoma to play the next day with their third string goalkeeper who got hurt. And the second stringer came in with a fever of 102. So, and it was still a pretty competitive match. I think Utica scored like six or seven goals. True. My tears have their reasons, okay? The heart knows what the heart knows. Tacoma's in the C tier. Also in the C tier is Baltimore. Baltimore is good enough to beat bad teams. But if you want to say they're back, they ain't back, man. They're not back. They're good enough to beat the Heat and the Ambush. And they've been beating the Heat, and they've been beating the Ambush. That's that's what the Blasts have been doing. That's how they've come back. Their three wins are against Harrisburg, St. Louis, and Harrisburg. All at home. I'm not rating yeah. that. Because let's get to the D tier. Empire. Empire. Today. Today. Uh, Empire's got two wins on the road. Empire's been struggling defensively. They've been scoring some goals. They've been struggling defensively. They can't be higher than this. None, none of the teams above them on the tier list, Empire can look at and go, no, we are better. Tacoma's already beaten them a couple times in Empire. Put them in the D tier. Put Dallas in the D tier. Put St. Louis in the D tier. We're hoping for a win, Harrisburg. We're pulling for you, buddy. <laughs> we are pulling for you. We're pulling for Harrisburg wins and Monterey losses the rest of the year. And that's uh, that's the Elston 2.0 version of the MASL tiers list. That's how I see it right now. Tony, would you like to adjust anything? Please feel free. Disagree. Engage. I mean... Just looking at this, it it reminds me just like a food chain. That picture of the little fish eating the, getting eaten by the bigger fish and the bigger fish. I think this this follows with Blast getting those wins against the ambush and the heat. I, I think, you know, somebody has to beat them. Somebody has to not let the ambush uh, 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 get any sort of tracking or the heat get a win. And and you know, at the end of the day, it's I think as as sound as can be. Honestly, I'm looking at that A tier, and if there's going to be any other contender to join them from the East, or if the Outlaws can get out of that that ranking, but if any movement is possible, I see maybe Tacoma joining the B minus level. But other than that, I think this is how it's going to be the rest of the season, barring any interest. But obviously, you can have some switches later on that could lead to this situation or that situation. Sure, but. Ultimately, I think this is as solid as it's going to be. And looking back at what's been happening this whole season, I think the data shows this is exactly how it's been. And I mean, again, no dissing anybody else, but show me the data that show that tells me otherwise. Show me the games that, show, that tell me otherwise. Everything considered, you have to understand that. Yeah, there's going to be games that there's going to there's going to be situations that happen with travel, with injuries, with that game with no goalkeepers with a combined 200 degrees body temperature between two players is not okay ever, <laughs> especially the goalkeeper situation concussion protocols. I mean, with all that in, taken into consideration when it comes to it, if the, if on a neutral playing field with a ball being dropped, I think this, this follows. And I think I have to agree with the Elston 2.0 tier list. We'll see. We'll see as we get closer to the playoffs. If this does change in any kind of, situation i'd love to have that same breakdown from the league and their rankings as far as this is why this is why this is why you know that's why yeah you know. uh, well, no they just said it was some algorithm I'm like there, there ain't no advanced stats machine <laughs> for the major arena soccer league whatever algorithm they have <laughs> there ain't no algorithm what are you talking about utica city's number two and we're four because of one loss like what okay this is the list right here. Take a look. This is the tier list right here. If you're a soccer fan and you're mad that San Diego's two on the list, 
get to that level. Get to that level where we feel yep. like you're going to beat Monterey. If you're a fan of one of those Eastern squads and you're you're a little upset, I've, I've got you all in a. I mean, I think it's very logical. The Flash are the far and away Eastern favorite, and then there's three teams that are in a boat mm -hmm. together. In the West, I believe the Soccers and Savage are the far and away favorites to meet in the con or in the division final. Texas has an argument. They're a tier below. Tacoma could take that place and flip-flop with Texas if they can get results against the Outlaws. Yeah. Procrastinating Puma. Exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. They, they just went and spent, you know, a half million dollars with some quant firm to come up with an algorithm for their tiers list. <laughs> They're using an easy bake oven, guys. I mean, <laughs> it's it's not that complicated. Have you ever heard of football manager? A oh, video game. That? Oh, so okay. It's, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a video game. Yeah. Where you just, it's a soccer simulation simulator with no real actual soccer. You just scouting in this. And I think that's the, the engine. They just created MASL teams, put names and just here you go and just let it run and see how it goes. And we'll run with that. That's we'll have computer versus computer. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, they had probably Baltimore Blast making the championship run in, in this yeah, in this course. situation. I mean, yeah, they put in some historic numbers. It was uh, it was an algorithm created by a W Vanzella. Uh, we don't know who this was, but nonetheless. Um, all right, let's get to some soccer news briefly. Uh, let's start off with the latest cup in the cabinet. Hey, put the cup in the cabinet. The soccer are U.S. Indoor Cup champions. Champions. It really cracked me up that John Green changed, I think, our profile pick on Facebook or something to them holding up that trophy. I'm like, it, it's on X2. <laughs> That's the the header. <laughs> Look, I appreciate I appreciate his passion. <laughs> Where is the cabinet? Asks procrastinating Puma. Good question. The cabinet is uh well, there's a couple cabinets. There's one at the sports arena down in the Stella lounge that has a number of old trophies and all of the previous championship rings. Uh, and then there's the uh, kind of like side table at the soccer's office where the current Ron Newman cups and MASL shields are. And I'm guessing that they're using the pro indoor cup there as either, you know, a candy holder or, you know, paperweight. Some look, you shouldn't give out a cup for an exhibition match. I think everyone could agree that if it's a meaningless exhibition, that there isn't a cup associated with it. Um, Thursday's futsal exhibition on many levels was successful because this was a league endeavor. This was the league, the major arena soccer league, looking to make inroads with the United Soccer's Soccer Coaches Convention, trying to get a foothold, an inroad to have indoor discussed and, and, and contemplated at this giant convention of outdoor coaches. Uh, they staged this. In order for that to happen, I don't think the league was happy with where the court was, which was nowhere near any of the convention action. It was around the corner down the way from a behind-the-scenes area. There was no broadcast, for what it's worth. Uh, and... The soccer's wound up playing. I see S. Barber mentioning it in the chat. Like they wound up playing a few too many regulars on Thursday. Charlie played, Tavoy yeah. played, Sean Callahan played, and then he got hurt on Sunday. Uh, you know, a few guys, a few guys played in that match more than we'd like. Absolutely, Susan. Absolutely. But remember, there's no soccer's too. Absolutely. And because there's no soccer's too, there just isn't that entire second team of players that San Diego can conjure up and, and run out on a floor uh, to play futsal. They literally didn't have the manpower to just, you know, unless they wanted to put like a seven man team or an eight man team out there. So Xavier played, you know, some, some guys that are on this club played and then those players wound up playing three games in four days over the course of the weekend. And, you know, some of those players really struggled on Sunday, uh, to be sure. Um, I, I really don't want to say that much more about this. This was an MASL deal. 
all the way through. And, you know, kudos to the Soccers and Strikers organizations. Empire did a lot of the setup on this, uh, much more than San Diego did. So big ups to the Empire crew. You know, Philly and the Panda were there. Uh, you know, a lot of the kind of infrastructure Empire was in charge of getting that taken care of. Uh, Jimmy Nordberg doing a lot of work there for Empire to make sure it was all organized. Sean Bowers for San Diego doing a lot of work to make sure it was all organized. Our front office was there selling merch. You know, we were there doing social media and whatnot. Um, it was a big endeavor for everyone for a thing that was in a back room that, you know, tree falls in the forest type situation. But if the league was happy with it, good. I really hope the soccer's don't play in the next one of these. I, I hope it's somebody else entirely. Um, the best thing that came out of it was this kid, Juan Salazar. You know, Salazar was the third round pick of the soccer's at a point Loma Nazarene uh, University in the MASL college draft. Uh, came previously from Cal State San Marcos. Uh, but prior to that, he was a, a Colombiano. He was playing on the streets of Colombia uh, until he moved to the U.S. when he was 16. And Salazar scored a hat trick in the futsal match uh, and then got the chance to go up to Tacoma. And he scored a goal in his first shift for the San Diego Soccers in an indoor match. So uh, the thing I really like about Salazar, Tony, he's 24, he's 6'2", he's cut, and he's left-footed. And he's got a scorer's mentality. And you add all those things up, and you've got a player that might be able to make some damage on the offensive side of the floor for the San Diego Soccers. Now, what does he know about defense? Nothing. <laughs> 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 he's an outdoor forward that's just come indoors. So what does he know about defense? He knows nothing about defense and it will take a little while for him to learn. But if they could spot him in the lineup in various ways, Tony, I am really excited about the potential of Juan Salazar. Yeah. And I was catching up with him before the match on Sunday, just congratulating him on coming in the hat trick and uh, obviously getting his first MASL goal. And he's incredibly excited to be playing here and, you know, being a PLNU alum, he's like, I'm estoy listo para. He has that Colombian accent. Like, I, it caught me off guard. I was like, hey, I called him Juanito too. I was like, it's like kinship already. I'm like, hey, queda Juanito. I was like, oh, hola, cómo estás? And and even before we we left, he saw me again and and said said goodbyes. But really, really cool kid and really a, a possibility for a good special player when it comes on the offensive side of things, especially to throw in when things might not be working uh, with the regularly scheduled programs, maybe this year's Irving Mojica in a breakout sense away. That's a great call. And by the way, Irving Mojica is starting for the Monterey flash mm -hmm. next to Ismael Rojo and Poyo Ruiz. And if you want to know why Monterey is so good, it's not just that they got a whole, you know, sheath of players from Chihuahua. They got three very important players from San Diego as yeah. well. Critical depth players uh, from San Diego. Uh, the Texas match has been rescheduled. The January 7th water main match. We mentioned it on the broadcast. I got a little note from Sean afterwards. Like this isn't official. Don't say it. Well, then the next day it was official. So <laughs> there I am out there spilling beans once again, spilling tea, uh, but it is official. Soccer's and outlaws will play Tuesday, February 13th. So downside. The Soccers and Outlaws, this is an important series, obviously. Texas is right now with three extra matches played, one point ahead of San Diego in the standings. Soccers won all six of these points, and they're going to play a Tuesday night and a Thursday night in the same week. The only two midweek games now for San Diego on the home schedule, 7.30 on a school night, 7.30 on a work night. I mean, these are going to be two small crowds. February 15th, we've got the $3 Bud Light night. We've got free parking. We're trying, we've got the new kits that we'll be, by the way, revealing in two shows. Uh, next, I think next week. We'll, we'll, we'll do it next week. All we'll right. reveal those next week like uh, on Soccer's Overtime. You'll, you'll get to see that uh, on Soccer's Overtime in a week and start to get hyped. And you will get hyped uh, for those kits on February 15th. But, um, Question on AA Tori asks, is the media game getting rescheduled? Yes, the media game is getting rescheduled. I, I talked to Sean this afternoon and he's like, okay, well, right now we've got media game scheduled for February 13th. And I said, we might want to change that. Yeah. <laughs> because there's a lot of media members that won't be able to be there on a Tuesday night. Exactly. So I'm angling for the media game to move to March to either March 1st, March 3rd, or March 10th. March 1st would be Star Wars night. Oh. 
And I know that would make Travis Peterson very upset because the the spinning lightsaber uh, exhibition that we've done in the past <laughs> might not might not be available, uh, and instead the media game. But I kind of think I think Star Wars night would be a really cool night to do this a Friday night, you know, big crowd, festive atmosphere. Um, Tony approves. Oh, you know, I'm uh, yeah, March third, March tenth, also possibility. So stay tuned for that one. Uh, but we're looking at we're looking at putting the media game on a day that's not a, a Tuesday night reschedule. I mean, it's just ugh. I'd kind of rather take the bullet on the on a Tuesday night and then get to a chance to maybe build a bigger crowd uh, for the media game. So that's the reschedule. Oh, there's a game tomorrow, Tony. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a game. Uh, Soccer's an Empire tomorrow night, Ontario Arena, 7 05 p.m. on MASL underscore soccer. Philly in the dock and the panda on the call. Yo, big, big ups. I, big, big ups to what's going on with the Ontario broadcast. I think it's great. Empire broadcast. Sorry, you, you're still physically in the city of Ontario. Empire isn't a thing, it's not an actual place. Um, a- so much great work. My guy, Mike Cepeda, they're putting up great graphics. They got the Spanish language broadcasters now from Bamos Strikers. They're adding La Cotura de Español into the the broadcast. They're really doing a great job. They're well prepared. That broadcast has just gone up, up, up each of the last three years. I'm just really, really, really impressed. You know, Philly is now doing ESPN Plus games for like UC Riverside. He's taking a big step up. The doc is just one of the great gentlemen and ambassadors of the sport, ever positive, ever flowing with, with great information. Panda, it's just really cool. It's, it, it's really, really cool. I'm psyched to see good broadcasts. I'm psyched to be, see people who are invested in the growth of this league. And, and all three of those folks are deeply invested in the growth of this league. And I know that Empire and San Diego, you know, like a, a regional rivalry. And a couple of years ago, you know, championship bound and blah, 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 blah. And like, you know, Empire getting a little big in their britches, but uh, these guys are are great. I root for them. I cheer for them. I, I support all of their success, and, and I really think they've found their legs as a broadcast. Yeah, no, it's it's really fun. I was I caught myself not being able to watch um, their last game, but just being able to listen to the match. That's how you can really tell the quality of, of a broadcast team is just being able to be drawn in. And you know, I I, I love my myself some AM radio um you know broadcast for for any sport and and if they can bring you in in that audio audio sense it's it's incredibly immersive and it's a rare skill and it's something that you know i i strive to even think to be po- possible if i can do it but you're one of those also that does that too you paint a picture you guys do such a great job and honestly the strength in commentaries on the west coast i'll just say that much i can't disagree with any of that um I don't think there's a lot to break down for this empire match. To me, this match is about the San Diego soccers. Yeah. It's about how this club reacts to losing and to the way they lost. You know, there's, there's one train of thought and I see K Vibbert in the chat saying it. I feel sorry for, for empire an angry soccer's team <laughs> after a loss. If the soccer's come in angry, for, forget about it. Forget about it. Yeah, the soccer's come in sad, or mopey, or finger pointing, or with any dissension at all. That's how you open the door for a Fabian or a Ponce or a Stinson to to put a couple in behind you to maybe take a lead to maybe get the crowd into it to to give the underdog an opportunity. I believe the soccer's on a not very good day will beat Empire even on the road. I, I just don't think the strikers are in a position right now. As you saw, we did the tier list. You know, there's there's two tiers in between uh, the two clubs. So I see this as a soccer's win, Tony. If it wasn't, I think it would be a major, major statement as to the psyche of the San Diego soccer's and how one loss became multiple losses uh, a- a- as a result. And it would be a lot more about what Chihuahua did to them on Sunday. Uh, it- it's This is really a check for me in terms of from a coaching staff to a captainship, leadership. Where is your mind? Where is your heart? 
Are you connected as a unit? Are you together? If the Sockers are together, they're going to womp Empire. If it's a close game, even a San Diego win, but a very close game, I think you can absolutely fairly leave Toyota Arena saying, okay, something's up right now. There's something that needs to be fixed with San Diego before they get into some really tough road matches at the beginning of February. Yeah, I have to agree with that. A gut check is what this match is and really testing the metal of who is on this team. And if you can handle it here or take care of it here, even if there was an issue, you can get to take care of it now uh, before it starts festering and becomes a bigger issue when the lights are brighter into the playoffs and then, you know, have that situation, then just get out of hand. Just let's take care of it now. I like what the comment right here. It's just like a business approach. Just come in and just take care of it. Let's go. And another one, let's let's go back to our regularly scheduled San Diego Soccer's way of playing and that championship mentality, which, you know, it might have taken a little bit of a hit, but the heart of the champion's always there. And is this team exactly that? We'll see. Callan asks oh, if we've won a road match by more than a goal this season. Yes, the first match at Tacoma, I think they won either 9-6 or 9-7. Uh, it was an eight, seven win in Dallas. And it was, uh, obviously a one goal win up in Tacoma again. Uh, but sack soccer's have been really good in Ontario. Obviously Ontario murdered them last year, 10 to four with Tayu and Costa, you know, I think Tayu had four goals and Costa had six points and those guys aren't there. So, uh, you know, Fabian's there. Fabian's doing great. Fabian's hey, doing yeah. tremendous five games. I think 17 points, like. He's kicking ass, uh, and and that's great. Uh, he's not defending. I don't think Marco Fabian. You can tell me, Tony. I don't think he's known for his, you know, world class defending. No, sir. Um, but you know, impressive and and good for Empire. You know, uh, good for Fabian. Ponce played that first game. He didn't play the last game. I don't know what the deal is with, with Ponce uh, down there, but we'll see. Seven oh five tomorrow. Will the Soccer's come out and run the show and win? eight, two or 11 to three or, you know, 12 to four or something like that. Um, I'd say the majority of outcomes fall into that bucket, but I think there's still a goodly number of, of, of results in another bucket of the soccer's still coming out, feeling a hangover from the Chihuahua game, maybe still feeling disconnected as a team. Again, two straight matches scoreless in the first quarter, scoreless in the third quarter. So score goal in the first quarter tomorrow. That should be goal number one for the San Diego Soccer's is get goal number one in quarter number one. If you do that, I think you're going to be off to the races. Yeah, and I think, again, this is a perfect opportunity to really take that approach of let's put that in the back, know that it's possible to be in that situation and be on a losing front, and now that you kind of have that, use that as fuel, as almost fear of never wanting to go back there at all or even close to it. So let's be lethal. Let's take care of business. Let's do things as we know how to do it. And that's it for this episode of Soccer's Overtime. A little bit longer because we had two matches, but more importantly, a loss to discuss. So <laughs> dropping in the uh, NASL Ken Pop rankings, or whatever they're calling. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So we had to do a tier list. What's this, Eddie Trujillo? Four one Kansas City is leading in the second quarter. Let me get myself to a Twitch channel to watch this show. Let's, let's, let's wrap up this show. Uh, this is spectacular, and let's get to the one down in Monterey. Maybe, maybe we did the podcast first. Little tiny curse on the flat. <laughs> Will they possibly even lose one game? And they're like, "We'll lose a game today." Hold my beer. Maybe that'll happen. Let's go find out. Everybody, special thanks to Xavier Snare Williams making time earlier in the afternoon to be with us on the show. Special thanks to you, Tony, for everything you do. Let everyone know where they can find you on social. You can go ahead and find me at San Diego Punto Football. Anything San Diego Punto Football underscore Tony Sanchez. I mean, it's it's there. You'll get some interesting stuff, but for the most part, anything soccer in San Diego, San Diego Punto Football. Greg. You can follow me on Twitter or X at 619 Sports. You can follow me on Instagram at 619 Sports and Life. If you like cute pictures of my dog, you would definitely love my I love feed that. at 619 Sports and Life. <laughs> and don't forget, Annie and Elston back on the air tomorrow morning, 
10 a.m. to 2 p.m. every Monday through Friday, four hours of myself and Annie Heilbrunn on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. So if you have not, please uh, partake. Hey, we talk soccer's today on the show we're doing a new segment tony it's called the 12 o'clock sports fix every day right at high noon we're coming on with a newsy fast-paced high energy segment that is starts with all local sports so we talked seals we talked soccers we talked goals we talked ucsd usd SESU, padres signing dominic you know dominican free agents a- anything we'll get to the national stuff too in the 12 o'clock sports fix but if you want to hear your local news you can find it every day, 12 o'clock on 97.3 The Fan. Okay, Love that's that. it. For Tony Sanchez, I'm Craig Elston. Thanks to all you great soccer fans. No comments on the other screen. And until we meet again tomorrow in Empire, go soccer's.